All right, these are my thoughts on the Shonen Jump issue for the week of November 12th, 2018. The first chapter of this week was Food Wars, chapter 287. And uh, the first big thing that happens here is a big news crew, and a lot of judges also that we've seen from various events at uh, Totski come in to uh, interview Tsukasa. And because they're all excited that uh, they have a feeling that he can probably beat the noir. If anyone could beat him, beat them, uh, they say he can. I would argue that Irina would be more likely to be able to do that than him, <clears throat> because she beat him. But still, he is a very skilled chef, and so many of the others point out that they're also very skilled, and not to count them out. But uh, uh, the judges do stick around. To watch the proceedings. And uh, right off the bat, very early in the chapter, someone makes his dish from convenience store items. It is centered around canned beef. And he talks about the steps that he's going through to make it as he makes it, as opposed to explaining to the judges later, which is how we know that this isn't going to be his final dish, because they normally save the explanations for the end. And sure enough, uh, the judge uh, says that his dish is worth negative $14, because even though it is very tasty, he did not do anything to improve the ingredients. He just put them together in a way that they tasted well together, but he didn't transform them. And so because he spent uh, the, the ingredients were worth $14, she says that he, he should be charged $14 because he used their inventory. So she actually demands his wallet and takes the money from him. Um, Tsukasa, on the other hand, makes something that earns him $587. So he passes round one using the main ingredients of a frozen pie crust, pre-cooked hamburger patty, and chicken salad, which he was able to transform such that everything was unrecognizable. And so he, he goes straight on. And I'm assuming Soma will spend the next couple dishes trying to catch up. And the judge takes note to ask him before he goes back to try again if he would um, if he would expect a hundred dollars if he sold what he made at Yukihira. Um, he said, "Well, no, uh, maybe a thousand yen at best." However. He says that there is a dish that he knows that at Yukihira they do sell for over $100. And so he's going to make that. The problem I have with this is that uh, that would be the second dish in a row that uh, you will have made that was something that was already on the menu at Yukihira. So thus far, he hasn't done anything new or creative. I don't want this to turn into... Uh, him proving how great the food that his restaurant that his dad ran uh, serves by winning the competition with them. I mean, I get that he wants to take over the restaurant and and prove that he's capable of that, but go on, you know, do something creative. Um, I'm pretty sure that eventually he'll start whipping out <clears throat> original things like the stuff we've seen so far. But it is strange to see him making things from uh, from the restaurant. That's an oddly by-the-book approach for him. Uh, the next chapter was One Piece, number 924, uh, in which Law tries to warp Luffy away since he's passed out after Kaido one-shotted him, but his powers are disabled because of Sea Prism Stone that hit him in the form of a nail, a single nail fashioned from Sea Prism Stone that Hawkins flung at him. Yeah, he says that in Wano they have the most talented artisans in crafting Sea Prism Stone because Wano is where it originated from. So Law has to make his escape on his own. Meanwhile, Kaido has his people. Um, he orders them to lock Luffy up, but the, the first wave of people that all approach him pass out because even though he's unconscious, he activates the hockey of the Supreme King anyway. Um, notably, even though he's passed out, he is also still glaring. So this is obviously representative of his 
intense will, which is what the hockey of the Supreme King runs off. Uh, meanwhile, while this is going on, uh, the Straw Hats managed to escape from Kaido's blast because, you know, of course they did. Uh, they wouldn't off him so unceremoniously. Um, it turns out that Shino, that uh, new Kunoichi um, that just joined the group, has the ability to age things, and so she aged the ground underneath them to make a sinkhole that they could hide in, which is a uh, which was uh, very cool. I think that's a neat application of that ability. Uh, elsewhere in the country, uh, news is getting out to everyone. Newspapers are uh, saying, hey, this Luffy guy, or um, what are they calling him? I want to. Uh, Luffy Taro. This Luffy Taro guy tried to attack Kaido, but he got one shotted. And so we get to see each Straw Hat member in turn. Uh, at first think, oh, you know, so they made it to Wano because they saw the name Luffy Taro, but uh, then make an extremely humorous face when they read the rest of the thing about him trying to attack Kaido. Uh, Robin seemed to be the funniest. Um, Zoro, or Zolo actually, is how they translate it in the manga, which is kind of weird. Um, that's how I first read it, but I know that most people... Uh, say it Zoro, so I'll probably make an effort to say this, but um, he, he actually doesn't make a funny expression, instead he just spits out the tea that he was drinking. Or, not tea, um, the soup, he was eating sushi. I don't know why I thought tea. Um, but, uh, so a little while later Luffy has arrived at the prison, uh, still glaring. He's all tied up, he can't move, being carried by, uh, by... Kaido's people who have strong enough will that they will not immediately collapse when they get near him. And, uh, he's thrown into a cell, which is also occupied by Eustace Kidd, who has been there for a while, apparently, uh, still wanting to defeat Kaido, similarly to Luffy. So, the idea of putting them in, both of them in there is that if their will is sufficiently broken, then Kaido can use them as members of his forces. Um, but considering how rebellious of an attitude the two are showing, uh, I doubt that's going to happen anytime soon, if at all. Uh, there is a third person in the area who has apparently been eating poisoned fish. Uh, there's no details about him, really, except for that he likes eating poisoned fish, and it has to be deboned before it's given to them, or else he spits the bones out and um, injures the guards with them. He can spit them hard enough that the bones can, uh, can harm the guards, so they've been appeasing him by giving him the poisoned fish. Uh, not sure who he is, um, and it'd be kind of funny if, if Admiral Magellan just showed up there, but I doubt it. Um, and the chapter ends with the statement that the first act of Wano has been completed. Uh, the next chapter was the fifth chapter of the comic, which is nearing its end. Um, the protagonist, Ryota, actually, um, because I didn't make the notes on it in a rush this time, uh, was able to remember his name. Uh, Ryota realizes that the detective and police and stuff that are after him might be tracking him by his phone, so he turns it off. And um, so now he doesn't need to worry about running away, and he can focus on finding a way to prove Mr. Himekawa is guilty in freeing himself and Mr. Baba from the blame for the murder. And a little detail is that uh, there were a bunch of costumed people out since it is Halloween, and one person was dressed as a Karibu. I thought that was a nice nod to to um, to Akahashi's other work. Oh, he's made various other works, but you know his his other big work and. Um, so Ryota and his sister uh, study another one of Mr. Baba's drawings, because that's where all the clues have come from, and realize that one of them is depicting a park in town. And so they go there, and underneath one of the benches is a note that has a picture of Himekawa and the woman that he murdered, and on the back is written the phrase Pumpkin Club. Uh, not sure what that means. 
but Ryota's sister <laughs> just straight up uh, boot uh, gets out her phone, boots up Himekawa's live stream because he's doing one of those right now, and in the chat uh, mentions the Pumpkin Club, and so he sees this is absolutely freaked out because of course he is because this is obviously something that a uh, that uh, is related to what he did, and um. And Ryota's sister also tells him to, to meet in the place where we can see the fireworks. Now, before Himekawa goes to the area, someone very large behind him that we haven't seen until now uh, asks how anyone else knows about the Pumpkin Club and just says, take care of it. So there's something bigger than a main author who didn't like a person going on here. So he goes to the park, the sibling confront him, and the detective also arrives. And um, it seems that uh, Ryota planned this, actually, um, because I guess his sister uh, chatted in the live stream on his phone, which meant that the detective could track him again. And so he would arrive there, and now he and Himekawa can, uh, can both make their cases conveniently in the view of the of law enforcement. So, <clears throat> not sure how he's going to prove that Himekawa did it, but uh, presumably he will because <laughs> otherwise the manga would end very sadly. Um, World Trigger, uh, chapter 167. Uh, the next match has started. And I'm not going to be doing a play by play because, like, because that would take just way too long. I'll go over the highlights. Um, the announcers discuss uh, strategic effects of the map. They are pretty sure that the building layout was chosen to hinder snipers. And I um, also think that there might be some strategic advantage to uh, the time being designated as night. Although um, operatives all have access to night vision, it seems. Um, and uh, also, they have the operators who aren't hindered by that. So the squads all radio each other and agree that first off, they want to meet up. Uh, each squad wants to join with other members of their squad. Um, and uh, the guy, I don't remember his name, the guy with the, the kind of a, the pointy teeth um, does a really neat trick where um, he, he uses Tryon shot from his finger like a grappling hook. And another agent does something similarly neat by turning the bagworm ability on and off repeatedly. Um, or maybe he hasn't started doing it repeatedly yet, but the answers are pretty sure that he's going to. Um, the idea behind that is it will distract the operators of enemy teams who will only be able to see him when the bagworm ability is off. And so if he turns it on, it'll pop up on their radars, and then if he turns it off, it'll pop off again. And he can try and distract them at uh, pivotal points so that his team will have an advantage. So uh, Mikumo is the first member of the main characters to run into a an opponent. And a fight breaks out, but he radios his comrades uh, not to come to his aid. Instead, he's going to try and lure the enemy to them, which I imagine will be kind of difficult because... Uh, the person who he's fighting, um, the rest of his team has met up with him. So Mikuma's going to have to survive long enough to lure all of them into a trap. And also there's a firefight going on between the other two squads in the upper floors. Um, so yeah, very neat tricks happening <clears throat> in this issue. Uh, that was one of the things that I always liked about this series, was the neat um, strategic moves that agents used. Um, Dr. Stone Chapter 82 was the next one, and uh, so Hyoga is still being electrocuted. Uh, his face looks quite horrifying, and he asks Senku how the heck he managed to make the the wiring and everything. What did he do to make it? Uh, you know, when did he have the time since they've been working on the demolition? And Senku explains that when Hyoga brought the, uh, the phone uh, with him and Tsukasa to the Revival Fluid Cave a number of chapters back and destroyed it, 
uh, that left all these wires exposed, so Sankey just quickly filmed them into some wiring, and I'm not sure where he got the batteries. I don't think that the, that the uh, phone had internal batteries. I'm pretty sure it had external power source, although I could be remembering wrong. But at any rate, he didn't have to make the wires, which would probably be the, the longest And uh, so he proclaims that this was is the the birth of the 100,000 volt stun gun or rebirth rather. And um, Yoga passes out his the last thing he says is freaking science. Ugh. And um, he goes thank you, high five Sukasa, and um, and uh, Omura has noticed the very large display that the electrocution created. So she went to try to help yoga, but the rest of the mem of the fighters of the Kingdom of Science have arrived to stop her, and so a little, uh, a little time passes. There's a note that says that this is the end of the Stone Wars part of the story. Act 2 is finished. A little time passes. Senku's fine. Uh, he explains that aside from the manganese batteries, he was able to endure the, br the, the brute force of Yoga's attack. Because uh, when he made that um, the tank, and he was testing out the sturdiness of it by having Kinro uh, attack him while he was holding it, um, that also served to build up his physical endurance a fair bit. So, so that's why he doesn't have like any internal wounds from being hit by someone strong enough to fling away an explosion. I mean, he's kind of bruised up, but you know nothing. Fatal. Tsukasa, on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> as we already know, uh, does have much more worrying wounds. So, um, Senku, uh, over a short period of time, uh, it must have been pretty short, uh, whips up instant bonding fluid to seal up the hole in his chest, and that will prevent him from bleeding out. But he is still dying because his organs were damaged by the spear, because the spear went through him. And um, Senku's hope is that now with uh, with all of Tsukasa's people on their side, that they can now firmly establish the Kingdom of Science as more of a kingdom than just a village. And um, the only way he thinks that it will be possible to heal up Organ, Tsukasa's organs would be if uh, they could figure out whatever the the flash of light that caused the petrification was and recreate that, and then they could petrify Tsukasa and drive him with the miracle fluid, and theoretically his organs would heal up just like everyone who's been brain dead for millennia. Um, have had their brain functions restarted by the miracle fluid. The question is, I have no idea, you know, how he could possibly figure that out. That would take a ton of testing, and surely Sukasa can't survive very long with his organs in this condition. Uh, I would imagine it might be a little easier if they had access to whatever started it, assuming that it hasn't eroded away. But if memory serves, uh, when we were seeing the uh, the astronauts' uh, point of view of the event, I'm pretty sure it started on a different continent, so there's no way they could get over there, even if whatever is there, whatever started it, is still there. Um, but aside from that, some uh, some other small developments. Uh, uh, we it has been confirmed that a statue which has been pieced back together. And then, uh, which has been glued back together, and then had the miracle fluid used on it, will turn back into a fully living person. Um, the first person Yuzi Hira managed to finish was a manga artist, and um, and the first thing he says is, "Oh no, did I miss my deadline?" <laughs> uh, and he certainly did, but um, uh, gives him a piece of paper, so he says, "You know, just do what you love," and. Um, and let's show everyone the, the fun side of scientific development. Um, 
So Yo has returned to the village at this point and decided, well, not the village, the, the Empire, the Kingdom of Science now. And he, uh, and he has decided that, okay, Hyoga and Humura are both being held up in prison, so he may as well kind of just sneak his way back into line and be uh, subservient to Senku and everyone. So Yuzuhira says, okay, you can help me put together the statues. Uh, speaking of the statues, Tsukasa, even as he is in uh, critical condition, has been uh, recalling all the places where he shattered statues and uh, dictating their locations, or their approximate locations. I'm not sure if he could remember coordinates, but he does remember uh, each area where he shattered someone so that uh, they can put them together as a way to try and right the wrong that he did, because, yeah, he basically killed these people. And, um, and he figures that it's only right for him to make up for it now. <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll presumably be finding out pretty soon what caused the petrification. And, uh, that's exciting. Um, on to Hunter x Hunter, um, chapter 388. Uh, similar to things like World Trigger, uh, a lot tends to happen in this series. There are a lot of text walls, so I won't be recounting absolutely everything, just what I found um, important enough to mention. So, uh, so Kropik and Bill are still training with the uh, various guards of the princes, and the first prince of the guards, who can sense Nen, uh, tell everybody else that uh, they will keep an eye on um, the people who are coming out of this chamber that Karapika and Bill are bringing in to, to awaken them. And they said that if they, if they detect that these people are being manipulated somehow by Karapika and Bill's own abilities, then they will let everyone know and uh, they will arrest them for, you know, trying to manipulate people. Although they privately think to themselves that they they want to let them do whatever they want because uh, that will allow them to figure out the nature of their powers. And that's very important to know in a franchise where powers can be uh, extremely varied. Um, so the first person exits the chamber and they know it. Okay, yeah, you know, they literally did awaken her her ability to, to use Nen, that's quite impressive, but she's not being manipulated. Um, and uh, she isn't allowed to tell anyone. Uh, they said that they don't want anyone uh, being told until everyone has gone in and gone through the same thing. So they bring the second person in, and we find out exactly what it is that they're doing, is Karapika is using his ability to lend Bill's ability to each person um, one at a time, because exposure to someone else's Nen can kickstart one's own. Uh, Karapika notes that oftentimes this is if someone is attacked by a Nen user, but it can also work like this. So, uh, it can, uh, awaken their Nen pores, I think they were called, I forget, whatever. Like, it can awaken their their potential for a brief time, and then while they have Nen, they can start doing the the uh, training to to keep their uh, their personal Nen active and develop their own abilities. And Karapika, after they bring the second person out, does tell everyone a little more information. He says that um, he he says flat out that by helping people, uh, more and more people learn to use Nen, he hopes to, to, that will contribute to his goal of ceasing the conflict, because if they're Nen users who are pro-conflict, they'd be a lot more wary of launching an attack when so many guards suddenly have an aura, like, um, because then they'd have to figure out, okay, what's this person's ability, you know, what's this person? Now, Bill does worry 
to himself that if any of these guards were to use abilities they developed to launch attacks, then that would be counter to their hope. And also, it would be very dangerous for himself and Karapika because neither of them have combat-focused powers. Finally, it is revealed has the ability to grow things. Or, uh, I think this is the first time that that's revealed. I'm not 100% sure. It's been a it's been a while since uh, since we've seen him and Karapika because you know the, the story keeps going on break. Um, now the other major interesting thing that happens in this chapter is a guard with the Nin ability that preys on other people um, is plotting about. He's trying to figure out how much risk he should take to try and gain information and improve the efficiency of his ability to uh, defeat the Ninth Prince, and also whether he should maybe try and learn about Krapika or the Fifth Prince. Uh, it's established that the Predators, that the Predator has a 48-hour recharge time after it takes action. Uh, it only grows from learning about someone's uh, nan ability if he didn't know about it already, and he has to figure it out himself. It can't be something that someone uh, else tells him. And so, well, it could be. It, it's it's um, hinted, it's suggested that it could be, but uh, it won't be as effective if that happens. So, he sells on, okay, I'm going to focus on the Ninth Prince, um, and I need to take a fair amount of risk, otherwise my ability is not going to work very well. Now the chapter ends when Karapika notices some kind of an aura uh, rumbling somewhere. He says this is the fourth time. So someone's power is, uh, is waking up, and uh, it is potentially... A bad news for the future. Um, Black Clover Chapter 181 has um, the Magic Knight Captain's nearly finishing off Langris, but he does the the kind of villainous breakdown, shooting attacks everywhere thing. Um, Finroll actually just makes one little portal and uh, and just punches him in the face while he's just throwing. Spatial magic everywhere. So I really love that <laughs> this fight was ended by a punch to the face, and the captains actually do lament that Manny kind of stole the glory with such a simple thing. Um, the focus turns to the uh, elves who were in the their giant floating rock thing. Uh, Patry, who was that guy who was acting as licked before. People are knowing that he's actually starting to look more like Licht now. And um, the real Licht was brought back by the reincarnation thing, but apparently he needed an artificial body that they prepared for him, so he's still sleeping. He's used to it, I guess. Um, and Patry says that it is time to complete their reincarnation, uh, because it, I guess it wasn't completed already. And this will free them of the side effect, all the side effects which they suffer at the moment, which would, I guess, include their uh, tendency to go berserk when things aren't going their way. Um, also, presumably, completely erase the people whose bodies they are inside. And actually, I think that all of the markings on their faces might be a side effect of the reincarnation also. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember if they had those when we saw them in the flashback. Um, but the last thing they need to do to finish this is fit their final magic stone into its pedestal in the ruins of the castle. So, uh, the captains, meanwhile, uh, Yami and the other sword guy are heading up to the giant floating rock. And they seem a bit overconfident, but, um, presumably reinforcements will show up soon. They seem to be acting as if uh, they think they can handle them all on their own, but, I mean, 
I don't know. We we saw what Mario Leona could do, so maybe. Um, next chapter was We Never Learn, chapter 87. Uh, while Fumino and Naruki hid it, hide in the supposed... Uh, it turns out, actually, no, it isn't completely empty. It has what Fumino recognizes as her mom's old laptop in it. And so, after her dad leaves, she plugs it in, and uh, they they look through it. Uh, they actually haven't le left yet, which is uh, pretty stupid. I mean, what if he comes back? But uh, there's a folder in there which is password protected. And it's got a message that says it will delete its contents if another incorrect pa password is entered, which means that Mr. Furuhashi has been trying to get in, but he couldn't because he didn't know the password. And Fumino says, well, he deserves it. Still know the password because she talked with her mom a bunch, so uh, it was probably something meant for her in the first place. So that night, she stays up late, uh, super motivated to... to study so that she can read her dream and prove her dad wrong. Yeah. But, um, the next day, uh, all of the Yuigas, save for Narayuki, are going to be gone all day. And so she decides that she's going to, uh, get up early and, um, and pay Narayuki back for his hospitality by taking care of all the chores. She tries cooking, she tries cleaning, neither of them work, because, as we know, that isn't her field of expertise. He's taking a bath later, and she just enters the bathroom and says, Screw it, you know, if I can't help you anyway, I'm gonna wash her back. And he's pretty sure that, uh, that her brain is exhausted from staying up late and getting up early. Um, indeed, it seems like she's not all there because she calls him gear <laughs> as she's washing his back. Uh, I know that in part it was probably an in joke referring to the, their, uh, discussion last chapter about, hey, this is kind of something that, uh, that a couple would do, yeah, but still, not, uh, not something that she would normally say, I feel. She's, she's usually very embarrassed about that. Um, actually, it initially appears that she's only wearing a large shirt, uh, but of course she has a swim, swimsuit on underneath, uh, just another one of those little fan service things, um, that serves mostly to freak Naruki out. Naruki suggests that uh, she maybe talk things over with her dad, but she says that no, uh, she's not going to do that. There's nothing left to say that she has left to say to him. Uh, she actually ends up falling asleep um, mid conversation, and uh, she does wake up before too long, and she realizes that she hasn't studied yet tonight. But uh, Naruki says that you know maybe you should sleep because you're pretty tired. She says no, I'm full of energy. And in response, he says, okay, well then, go on a date with me. And I don't know what he's planning. I know he's planning something. This isn't something that he would just... The question is, what is his plan, and why does it rely on starting by asking around on a date? So, I don't know. Um, we will see. Next up was Hero Academia, Chapter 205. So, Shoto is, is turning up the heat of his flames. And he tells Tetsu Tetsu... Get back, or you will melt. Very straightforward, and probably accurate. Um, All Might is watching one of the the camera feeds. The camera actually goes out, uh, just from the, the heat of his fire. But All Might, who knows, maybe, maybe he can tell from this far away. He um, recognizes that his fire is as hot as Endeavor's. It's not clear whether this is Endeavor's normal fire or Endeavor's blue fire. I'm actually leaning towards the former because um, because a while later in the chapter, after he and Tetsu Tetsu have been fighting for a while, because Tetsu Tetsu insists the heat longer than Todoroki can. So he just starts grappling with him. And uh, near the end of the chapter, Todoroki tries to finish him off. And he thinks go past your limits. So I think that was when he started uh, using his blue fire. But I suppose the only way to know for sure would be either wait until uh, it's 
until he addresses it, or wait until the anime adapts it. Because, like, we didn't know Dobby's fire was blue until the anime. Uh, well, Todoroki was fighting Tetsutetsu, uh, Pony and Shoji were squaring off. I think this is the first time I remember him actually attacking with his a He's He's taking out her horns as she shoots them at him. Uh, one of them gets by him, but before it can catch him, uh, Ojiro grabs it and breaks it, and then he jumps on her head and keeps her horns from uh, shooting out so that she can't control anyone. However, uh, Juzo, uh, seem, uh, Juzo uh, softens the ground so they all get, uh, start sinking into it. Then he goes down, swims through, and uh, he's about to assist Tetsu Tetsu, who Shoto is, from what I understand, about to turn up his heat to blue. Uh, Juzo tells him, hey, don't do that, because you'll literally melt him. And so he softens something bowl and it lands on Todoroki. And uh, Ida arrives back and kicks him in the head. And just that one kick is enough that he's um about ready to pass out. But uh, before his quirk turns off, he softens the bottom of a very large structure and yells for Tetsu Tetsu to push it over. And uh, he isn't looking very well. It's clear that he got burnt pretty badly, but he manages to push it over before he collapses. And the thing lands on Ida, who, who I guess... I feel like, with how fast he was going, this must have been a really big thing for him to get away. Uh, actually, it was probably just, the conversation probably just happened in anime time, so, uh, he's probably still pretty close. But at any rate, uh, so he gets taken out, and now everyone is down, so that means that the third match ended in a draw. The last chapter of this issue is The Promised Neverland, chapter 111, which starts out with Yel noticing that there are five kids missing. And so she tells Emma, everyone gets up, spreads out. They find one of the kids, but he warns them to get away. And, um, right away, it's shown why, because uh, one of Emma's groups gets his head shot. And so, he's just dead. That's another casualty carried out by these invaders. Um, so, um, the guy also shoots the kid who was, I think, being used as bait. And, um, and I'm I think it hit him in his Achilles tendon, is, or at the very least it hit him in his And Andrew steps forward, and good lord, now that we can see his entire face, it's horrifying. Half of it's gone. This Half of his face is melted off, and the other part has got various wounds on it. And uh, he orders everyone to get on their knees. Everyone's quite horrified by the fact that they, they can see some of the bones in his face. And he calls them pigs, and stomps in the leg of the kid whose leg was shot, uh, which must hurt a ton if, if being shot was, didn't hurt enough. So everyone um, gets ticked off, they stand up, they all hold him in their sights, but he says that he knows they can't do it. And he says, isn't that right, Emma? I know you can't do it, uh, because I heard, heard all about you from Phil. He said that you were too gentle to hurt anyone, uh, because you cared too much about people. So that tells us what happened to Phil, or at least the start of what happened to Phil in that chapter when he was taken away from the farm, so he was being used as uh, for information, basically. Uh, don't know what happened to him after that, though. Um, we can hope he's alive, but considering how dark things have been recently, it's anyone's guess. Um, explains that he actually shot um, he shot three of the other kids. Um, he, he's got uh, the fifth one. He's holding her hostage, actually. That's how he got everyone to get on the knees. I forgot to mention that. Um, but the other three, he shot them all dead, and he said that they had an opportunity to kill him. You know, they had the numbers advantage, and he was wounded, but they didn't, because... As he puts, they're weak. He said they're they're idiots, just like the two from Glory Bell. Because <clears throat> when Lucas was wounded, Hugo didn't leave him behind, so that slowed him down in getting to the armory. And um, 
know, even though if his plan was to blow up the whole place anyway, Hugo and Lucas were both gonna die in their other way. So, so really, it was just sentimentality that had Hugo bring Lucas with him. So Andrew kind of has a point, as as much of a jerk of he, as he is, he kind of has a point, and he brags that that the explosion didn't work. He's still alive. Really don't know how he's still alive, but he says fate is on my side, and um. And I'm going to kill all of you, too. But the chapter ends with Emma aiming at, aiming at him, and a single bang just rings out. Uh, it isn't made clear who shot. I do hope it's Emma. I think this is a step that she has to take um, to realize that, hey, you know, just because humans are humans, you know, they can be easily as... as any of the demons, even more than some of the demons. So, yeah, we'll have to find out who fired the gun next time. And, yeah, that is the end of this issue. To, to keep doing this, uh, again, even if not for reviews, just for the fact that I get my thoughts out. So, uh, like I said in the last one, I hope that you enjoyed my rambling. And uh, if you leave a like, then uh, that will motivate me to ramble.